Hi there, Ella. How Hello. are you? <laughs> Good, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Ella, on the 5th of May this year, 2020, we published your father's uh, Holocaust memoir, Wolf, A Story of Hate. I thought it was an excellent uh, memoir, very intelligently written. He, I think he wrote it in the 1990s, didn't he? That's correct. Yeah. Yes. And you did a tremendous job in translating it from Hebrew into uh, English. Um, I thank you very much for that because it is, you know, it is most fascinating memoir. Can you tell us something about uh, what your father wrote, uh, Ella? So uh, when when my children were born and very little, he started. Uh, speaking to them about the Holocaust as it did when I was a very young child. And I uh, felt that I needed to protect them from this information in a way that would be filtered. And so I suggested to him to sit down and write everything that comes to him with no consideration of time frame and um, consistency or fluidity in the writing. I just said, sit down and write everything that comes to you. And uh, during the course of the writing, I would ask him many, many questions to elicit new memories. So it was like a cooperative type of effort where over a certain period of time, he sat down and wrote everything that he could remember. And in parallel, I don't remember exactly the time frame, but in parallel, he recorded over nine hours of uh, testimony that is now at the uh, Washington um, Holocaust Museum. Right. So um, it, it was very important to sit down as he was writing it, to sit down with him and ask the questions because many of the memories were deeply buried inside and, and would only um, come back after I initiated questions or conversations around that. So all of this ended in a, a manuscript, a very intense manuscript that was a little bit random um, in terms of how it was written. And of that, I decided at that time to write it in English and to try and put some order. And also when I wrote it and translated, he was sitting next to me. And as we were doing this work, which took a long time, uh, things came back or changed a little bit. So it was really a collaborative type of work um, together in the early 1990s. Right. Yes. And was it a painful process uh, for your father as well as yourself? It was, it was painful, but it was more painful to revisit it and re-edit it years later when I was alone without him, to re-edit and, re and put it in an actual manuscript form, not just to... I think that what, it was a little bit easier when he was sitting next to me uh, and we were discussing it because there was also an inter, in, uh, intellectual type of dialogue where if I didn't understand something, I challenged him and we had a conversation about that. So um, it, it was not a simple task by any stretch of the imagination, but it was much more emotionally difficult when I took the document that we you worked on worked on at the time years ago and decided to actually put it in manuscript form. Right, I can see. Um, and the, um, the memoir has a specific angle. It's not just a, a Holocaust memoir. Uh, can you tell us a bit about that, please? Yes. Um, my father spent, <clears throat> excuse me, a number of years in camps that were owned by companies, by corporation, a corporation named the Hasag. H-A-S-A-G. 
and the angle of the corporate owned firms, uh, uh, the angle of, I apologize, the angle of the corporate owned camps were not seriously addressed or looked at in the context of the Holocaust. Uh, there were many, many such small camps, but they were de facto death camps uh, that were owned by companies uh, that were uh, in bed with the Nazis, uh, making money off the back of slaves that were, that they were exterminating. So there was a paradox between the financial and business interests of these companies and the fact that they tortured and starved and murdered their own workforce. Mm -hmm. um, and in relative numbers, many, many more people were murdered in these camps than in the well-known death camps. So everyone knows about Auschwitz, many know about other camps, Bergen-Belsen, Treblinka, and so on. But who knows about Skarzysko or Flossberg mm -hmm. or Schlieben or many other such very, very small camps? Uh, in the course of uh, 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 developing this story, um, uh, there was an article that I found about American companies that were operating camps with slave force during the war also. Mm. Uh, a, a, a couple of such companies that were quoted by the journalist Frank Rich uh, were GM and Ford, for example. Right. Um, but there were many other companies, and there are companies that operate today uh, in the United States and, and elsewhere who had labor camps yeah. and murdered Jews yeah. every single day, their own workforce. So that angle of the, the story and the experience is not something that Holocaust literature uh, often focused on. Indeed. And, yeah. and, and I think it's important that people realize what happened there and also the danger going forward in this world today uh, about the relationship between government and business and uh, especially under particular regimes where that can lead to. Yeah, exactly. Um, and Ella, given um, the, um, the enormous rise of anti-Semitism uh, of today, do you think um, that Holocaust memoirs like uh, Wolf can contribute somehow to uh, the knowledge of uh, what happened then and also to combat anti-Semitism. What's your opinion on that, please? That, that is a very, very good and complicated question. Um, I think that if these books are published and people passively read them, in other words, pick, pick the book up and read, I don't think it will create much impact. Mm. But if we take these books and elevate them to force dialogue and yeah. force education and force inter, not just interfaith conversations, but intersocial conversations, along with additional efforts of education and reaching out in, in a proactive way, then we can, then we can create maybe a dent and start creating ripple effect for positive change. But I think that if these books are published, the natural uh, tendency would be for those who don't need the education, who picks these books up? It's yeah. not gonna be some white supremacist in Kansas who's no. gonna pick the book up and say, maybe I should educate myself. No. So, um, so I think it takes a collaborative effort here. Uh, that can be done. I do believe we can create collective narrative changes, but I think it takes multi -layered, a multi-layered approach to doing it and systematic approach to doing this on many fronts over a long period of time. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think you're absolutely right, Ella, in, in, that, uh, in your opinion. Um, Ella, uh, we have about uh, one or two minutes more. Is there okay. anything else you might uh, want to add? Is there something I did not ask you that you would like to say? 
Well, you know, Lisbeth, we can talk about this from, for a long, long time. Um, I think that if we, I am, I, I am a very proactive person and I think that if we come up uh, individually or socially with specific plans, we don't need to change the whole world, but if we can create some positive changes around our own lives mm -hmm. and to create these, this ripple effect so that people understand, it's very important that people understand that when they read about one person, it's one person multiplied by millions. And I would like people to ask themselves, what would I have done? What if this, is, this was my mother, my daughter, my child, my husband, my wife? Then how would you read this story? and then multiply them by millions. I think it's very important to individualize it so people can really understand and internalize the depth of this tragedy and to make sure that it doesn't happen again via vigilance over who we choose to lead us hmm. and who we follow and how we follow and if we follow. Yeah. So there are many, many questions, Lisbeth, and um, I hope we'll have the opportunity to talk about it many times uh, going forward in the future. And I want to thank you. Thank you very much, uh, talk. Ella. Yeah, it was very good. And I will interview uh, you again once more because you've got so many things to say, valid points to say, really. Thank you very much for this fascinating interview, and we will talk again soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Have a great Bye -bye. day. Bye-bye.